So one of the contemporary big problems in molecular biology is to understand the folding of macromolecules like DNA, RNA and proteins. And the, the main basic problem is that you are given a word in a number of letters and there it depends on whether we're talking about RNA, DNA or proteins. For RNA and DNA it's four letters, for proteins it's 20 letters. But the point is that you're given this word in these letters and you want from that to predict the global three-dimensional structure that these uh, macromolecules fold into. And that's uh, been a problem for about 30 years in the field and a lot of people have worked on this. And um, one of the nice developments that, that were early on in the field, for sort of from a mathematical point of view, were something called Ramachandran angles. And uh, these are angles of dihedral angles along the backbone. So, so the backbone is made out of a number of peptide units which comes consecutively. And these, uh, these, these peptide units are stuck together in C-alpha atoms, they're called. And so there is one angle for the ingoing to the C-alpha and another angle for the outgoing. And these two angles are called Ramachandran angles and they can be plotted in Ramachandran plots and so when you are going along the backbone, knowing where you are in this Ramachandran plot tells you a lot about how the local structure of the protein is uh, uh, at various points. So for example, the two standard motifs that one knows is the alpha helix, where the backbone just does a you know, pyrrhic spin and, and uh, in fact it goes this way around and, and it has a pitch of about four uh, peptide units forward. And then you have another motif which is called uh, beta sheets where you have a strand running one way and maybe a strand running the opposite way and there's basically always in these patterns there are saturation of hydrogen bonds. This is entropic uh, favorable and, and, and is part of the whole folding process. But the point about the Ramachandran angles is that you can really see where if you are in alpha helix the Ramachandran angles are very constrained in line at a particular point in this plot. If you are in a beta sheet you can see that you lie somewhere else although these are not so regular. And so um, they have been extremely useful in describing you know, backbone conformations and they are sort of used also to specify what's called secondary structures of proteins which is studied a lot and one tries to predict those and there's lots going on of course about that. But one of the things that we put our finger on was to try to understand how do you describe the local geometry around a hydrogen bond. So if you don't focus on the backbone, but if you focus on this interchain interactions there are of these hydrogen bonds that of course are sitting in alpha helices or beta sheets, but also elsewhere, then you have two peptide units, and these two peptide units are coming close together, oxygen from one side, hydrogen from another, and they are forming a hydrogen bond. So not a chemical bond, but just a, a weak uh, hydrogen bond. But these are extremely important for stabilizing the folding of the protein. But nobody had sort of really put their fingers on a nice low dimensional uh, description of uh, what's the conformations. So for the backbone, I repeat, we have these trimetrantron angles, but for the, for, the, for the hydrogen bond, there wasn't really anything. And so the simple idea that we came up with, which was really inspired by lattice gates theory, um, was simply to say, well, uh, Due to a quantum mechanical effect, the peptide units are virtually planar. And also there is a direction inside this plane because there is a certain chemical bond that's sitting inside the peptide unit. And every time you have a plane in three space with an oriented line in the plane, you get a frame of free space, you get a basis of R3. Because you basically just take um, say the first finger is along the preferred direction the first two fingers are in the plane and the third finger is orthogonal to this peptide unit. So that gives you a frame, a basis of three space. And the other peptide units, so now I'm doing, I don't have two right hands, but <laughs> do my left hand instead, uh, there is also a frame associated to that. And the point now is that what we looked at was simply the rotation that takes the frame from 
uh, the rotating detector frame of one, say the donor of the hydrogen bond, to the, 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 uh, the acceptor of the hydrogen bond. Now, if you do that, if you just do that, then uh, this rotation that you get will conjugate if you rotate the molecule, so it won't work. And so you have to just do the standard thing in this, in this field is that you have to gauge fix. And so what you do is you really take this peptide, two peptide units that's lying in three space with their frames, and you bring one down in the standard position to the standard three frame, so the standard basis of, of, of Euclidean three space, and then the rotation from that to the other one gives you something that's a useful observable. And so what we have done with this is simply we went ahead and sampled it all over something called a protein data bank that records uh, all the structures of proteins known to, to, the, to the humans uh, at this point. It's a fantastic uh, thing that just records the structures of all the proteins. And so uh, there's about 1.1 million hydrogen bonds in, uh, in this database. And what we did was we took all the rotations of those and now there is sort of an Euler presentation rotations because a rotation is rotating around a certain axis and it rotates a certain amount. And therefore, you can simply represent a rotation by a vector whose length is equal to the amount of rotation and the direction of the vector is the, the rotation axis. This means that you represent all rotations in a ball of radius pi where you have to be careful that on the outer shell you have to identify antipodal points. So we did this, we plotted this, uh, this thing for 1.1 million hydrogen bonds, and it turned out it was extremely structured. It uh, takes up about uh, 20 to 30 percent of the volume of SO3 only. Uh, it clearly was sort of assembling into clusters. So it was not at all uh, just a uniform distribution, it was clearly a lot of structure. And so we have analyzed this by, by running many different uh, clustering algorithms on this data. And what we have seen is, of course, that there is various clusters that are strongly correlated with the known motifs. So there's, for example, what we call the alpha cluster, which has to do with alpha helices. There's a couple of beta clusters that has to do with standard beta motifs. But there are lots of other clusters which are correspond to interesting sort of new motives. They are called, they're related to turns and all kinds of things, but they are really sort of a very local sampling of what's going on. So what we reported was 30 different clusters uh, of varying sizes and varying peakness and so on. And uh, the point is that it's sort of not entirely local, I mean, in the sense that you cannot predict these rotations locally. And so, of course, the, 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 the next step that we are sort of involved in now is to try to see what is it actually that will enable us to predict what the rotation is for a given hydrogen bond. And so, what we did was simply to try to say, well, could it be so that actually just the combinatorial patterns, so if you have one hydrogen bond here, if I draw the backbone out here, and if I simply just record what are the nearby hydrogen bonds, and if I record a certain little window around a central hydrogen bond, will I be able to predict the rotation for the central hydrogen bond if I just know a small snippet of the protein and just know the graph? how the other hydrogen bonds are sitting. And actually, our latest study shows that this is actually doable. So we can uh, predict uh, about 90% of the hydrogen bonds within 1% of the volume of SO3. So that is a very narrow margin of, of, of variation that the rotation uh, is doing there. So, so it really seems to indicate that just the abstract local pattern of the nearby hydrogen bonds tells what the rotation is to a very high degree of accuracy. But this somehow suggests possibly a new way to try to understand folding. Basically, it is sort of trying to divide the thing into a process of two stages. So the first stage would be take the primary sequence and turn the primary sequence into a predicted graph where the graph just consists of the backbone 
Uh, so you have vertices for all the C alphas and you have edges for all the um, uh, 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 peptide units and then you have edges also for the hydrogen bonds. And you just want to try to see if you can predict the abstract graph that they form from the primary sequence. And if you can that, then these studies that we have just completed seems to clearly indicate that if you know the full graph, you basically know the geometric structure to a very, very high accuracy. We have actually uh, studied um, prediction of graphs for similar graphs for RNA uh, um, using ideas from quantum field theory. So the idea is that the graphs that arise are exactly like the Feynman diagrams that arise in quantum field theory. And so therefore, it's actually amenable to uh, the same techniques that people use in quantum field theory, for example, matrix models. And so we've devised matrix models, which uh, is, it, it does the enumeration problem for, um, for, 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 for RNA structures, possible graph structures. And also further, we have somehow uh, manipulated this into actual uh, prediction algorithms, which as an input takes the primary sequence for the RNA, and as an output provides a possible uh, graph structure. And so the idea is to take the similar techniques and now apply it to the more complicated situation where we have proteins. And so the, the words, they are more complicated because there are 20 of them. And, but the point is that somehow these local patterns that we have discovered that are really somehow, there's about 2,000 local patterns that we are seeing popping up now. And we're trying to understand what is the correlation between primary sequence and these patterns. And some of them have some clear significance. We're trying to devise energy contributions for each of such patterns and then trying to see if we can generate algorithms that generate all structures that it has a certain sequence of patterns. And this combinatorial problem we actually have solved very recently. If I should somehow ponder on where this could go in the future, um, uh, speculating uh, more wildly, I would say that right now in PDB we record the three-dimensional uh, coordinates of all the atoms. But of course, the, this is quantum mechanics. Uh, these are atoms. Uh, they are, are, are very small uh, structures that are in the regime of quantum mechanics. And if you take this, this, this sort of idea further that, you know, what we're really seeing is that the configuration of a protein is really a point in what we call moduli spaces. It's really a point in the moduli space of SO3 flat connections on the graph. And those uh, moduli spaces, they have natural quantizations and they correlate to, to quantum transignments theory. And you know, one might be led from this to expect that maybe these proteins in their very rigid course could maybe carry such quantum states which are delocalized all over the protein, maybe mainly preserved and, and sheltered inside the protein. But if this were to be true, we certainly need to record more than the three-dimensional coordinates. We also need to record some of these quantum states. Because one could imagine, of course, that proteins, when they interact, they could actually share quantum states. And by the way, we know that these moduli spaces, their quantizations, perform, that, that is technically a, a universal quantum computer. So that opens a whole new perspective. Could there actually be a quantum part to uh, molecular biology that actually these proteins are quantum computers themselves and they exchange quantum information and there is a whole quantum universe that we are not listening to. Right now we're just looking at, as it were, the hardware, but we're not listening into the software and if you look at computers and you only look at hardware, you hardly understand what they're doing. You of course have to look at the software as well. So that's speculation at the moment, but it would be a thrilling prospect if that was the case. <laughs>